So this is the second talk of the second session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Christoph Bales, and his talk is titled Automatic Performance Tracking of LLVM Generated Code. Thank you. So yeah, today uh, I'm going to talk about automated uh, performance tracking of LLVM generated code. Um, I had a bit of a severe cold earlier in the week, so my voice isn't perfect, but hopefully you guys can, uh, I will make it to the end, I hope. So, so uh, maybe I thought to first try to talk through a few reasons why to even bother spending effort on uh, tracking uh, performance uh, of the generated code. Well, so I think most of us, or there's at least quite a few uh, of us that care deeply about the quality of uh, top of trunk. Basically, there, there's lots of projects uh, picking up top of trunk LLVM rather than releases uh, integrated into other projects. Uh, and quite a few of us rely on the quality of that. Um, so basically, uh, we want top of trunk to always be very near to release quality. Um, there are many different quality aspects that could be measured, like correctness or the speed or compile time or other stuff. And I think for uh, correctness, we've got a pretty good uh, working system. There's lots and lots of both public and uh, private bots. And they make that correctness on top of trunk really is, uh, you, you can pretty much rely on it. Uh, yeah, of course, there's always going to be a commit that regresses something, but it gets caught pretty quickly. And yeah, there's still some issues with correctness bots where they are not perfect, but overall, um, correctness on top of trunk is good. So um, I started wondering, can we have the same with uh, the speed of the generated code? I think we're not quite there yet. Uh, and I'm going to explain a few of the things that happened in the past year to try to improve the situation and a few ideas on how to actually get there. Now, uh, <clears throat> so I, I started thinking about, so what do we really want to get out of these, out of a continuous integration system really uh, to track performance? Uh, and okay, I also cheated a bit. I went looking on Google, so what do people want out of uh, continuous integration? Uh, but it mapped pretty well on what I thought was needed. So we want issues to be signaled quickly. We want low false positive rates. We want low false negative rates. Um, when we get uh, an email back or a message saying, hey, your commit uh, seems to have regressed something, we want that information to be clear and actionable and you know immediately what to do. Um, we also don't want to spend a lot of effort on keeping that whole continuous integration system running. We don't want to spend a lot of effort just digging in. You want just a message back indicating immediately, this is the problem, this is what caused it, and uh, you get all the information that you know, okay, now I can act. And really, when all of that works well, we should get into a situation where um, all of us, we, we're not afraid of just acting on, we see a delta coming in, uh, a, a regression, we, we can act on that quickly. So I think for correctness, we have all of that. Uh, when something regress, regresses correctness on top of trunk, um, commits get reverted, uh, it, that all works pretty well. For uh, performance regressions, I think the situation, we're not fully there yet. So um, I also want to do something hands-on to understand the problem a bit better. And then half a year ago, uh, I got my hands on um, uh, an ARM Juno board. It's basically, it contains an SOC with a, a couple of Cortex-A53 cores in it, a couple of Cortex-A57 cores in it. Um, one of the nice things is that it combines both in-order and out-of-order cores. So for experiments further on in the slides, I have results for both in order microarchitecture and out of order microarchitecture. Um, and so I got the board and I could immediately have set it up, start pushing numbers into uh, the performance tracker. Uh, but I thought, yeah, well, we, we want all of these properties from our contingent integration system. And I started wondering, is there something I can do to 
to make the overall system uh, better. Uh, so, and right next to all of these concerns, I also thought, well, yeah, well, probably not everyone has access to this board. If I start producing numbers from this board, is it possible to present information in one way or another so that people who don't have access to this specific architecture or board, that still, it mostly makes sense when you get feedback on this board, something happens. Um, so I started by running uh, a couple of experiments. <clears throat> um, so what did I do? I took the programs in the test suite, that's about a bit more than 300 programs in there. Um, and I started running them uh, lots of time to uh, try to measure what's the characteristics of the noisiness of these programs uh, running on, on this platform. So on the chart, what you see is uh, each sub-chart, uh, I've always been running the program identically, so compiled with the exact same revision of Clang. Uh, it's a revision from about half a year ago, which is when I did the work. Um, and I run this with LNT and multi-sampling mode. So basically on the horizontal axis, you've got runs, consecutive runs, and you will see, uh, well, maybe on the next slide, in the more noisy results, you will see for each run, there's a number of different samples that were taken, so the program is run uh, a few times. Um, on the vertical axis, it's just a scale so that at the bottom you've got zero execution time and at the top, uh, so the, the, the slowest execution time is near the top of the chart so you've got a little bit of resolution to see uh, different, uh, uh, difference in execution time. And then there's this small sub-chart on the right-hand side that's basically the distribution uh, of all the samples just tilted on the side. So, um, yeah, the first question was, is there actually a lot of noise and when running these programs? Uh, so yeah, I was looking at a little bit more than 300 of these charts for all the single programs. I'm not going to bore you out with showing all these charts, but yeah, most of them, they're low noise. But of course, there's also exceptions. Uh, the next question I asked, well, okay, so is, is noise, is that inherent in the program or does it, is it different between diff running the same program on different cores? Um, and it turns out, yeah, um, a program can be very low noise on one core and can be very high noise on another core. Okay, um, something we learned, maybe we can use it later on uh, in improving uh, our analysis. The uh, next question I was wondering about, so when there is noise, is it always, is the noise distributed in the same way? Well, I just copy pasted five examples where I saw different distributions out of these 300 programs. So I've seen both a normal distribution, something that looks like a skewed normal distribution, something that looks like, like textbook example bimodal, uh, skewed bimodal, something that I don't know what the name is, maybe quad modal, something like that. Um, I think bottom line is if the conclusion I'm taking from this is if you're uh, um, going to analyze all of these samples and you're going to use some kinds of statistics for that, I think it's not a good idea to assume a certain distribution. All kinds of distributions can occur. Um, and then this might be the last question I've got a slide on. Um, is, is one core more noisy than another core? So on this chart, uh, it's uh, a histogram of uh, how many programs were how noisy. The blue uh, bars re uh, uh, represent the Cortex-A53, the red ones the Cortex-A57. Uh, so you see uh, in the 0% bucket, that's uh, programs with, which have less than 1% uh, relative standard deviation noise levels. Um, so yeah, and uh, the chart shows that somehow on, on the Cortex-A53, the programs tend to be less noisy than on the Cortex-A57. So just trying to summarize a few of uh, the insights from just looking at these uh, charts. Yeah, most programs are relatively, uh, have relatively low noise. But still, 10% or maybe a little bit more here in the test suite have uh, high noise. 
So probably it means that uh, we can't just say, oh yeah, a high noise, high noise program, that's one uh, that's just hard to analyze and we forget about it. You would be forgetting about 10% of all programs. Somehow we have to have a way of handling high noise programs. Um, so in the charts, you saw quite a few sample points on that. It was the same program run probably in total uh, a bit more than 100 times. And uh, so it was run through LNT, and in LNT, um, one program gets run, then the next program gets run, then the next program gets run. It gets back to the beginning. Again, one program gets run, the next program gets run, then the third program gets run. Um, so by, do, by doing it that way, still very consistently it showed up. Some programs have noise, some programs ha don't have noise. So that makes me believe that, yeah, I can trust that somehow there's an inherent property of that program running on that core that causes noise, uh, and it's not just uh, an influence of the environment or maybe an interrupt came in. It doesn't seem that that's the case. It's an inherent property of that program running on that microarchitecture. And I should also say that um, I've set up the board. To, uh, so uh, this was a, uh, on the Linux Debian distribution. Address-based randomization is enabled. Internally, we've had quite a few discussions about should you measure with address-based randomization enabled or disabled? And I believe that actually it gives you an advantage to uh, run with address-based randomization enabled because what you get is you get the, ex uh, the execution time of your program with different layouts of your program. This is assuming the compiler does not have control at all over where your program gets placed in memory, which is a real-world situation, address-based randomization tends to be enabled. Um, so, and the extra benefit it gives is when you're working on, on an optimization, um, you think uh, if you don't have address-based randomization enabled, you're on your program, you think, oh, I've got really low noise levels. You make some optimization, because, uh, it changes maybe just something in cold code, but because of that, the layout changes slightly, and all of a sudden you get another data point. At least with address-based randomization, you already get some randomization uh, before and after your compile, and it protects you a little bit against um, making false conclusions just because some layout of your program happened to be changing as a side effect of what you actually were working on. Uh, well, still, probably the uh, uh, address-based randomization doesn't really, um, it's not a perfect solution, but it's already at least a step towards it just, you get more of a feel of this is the actual noise level uh, of the program executing under conditions where from the compiler you don't have uh, control over. Um, oh yeah, and uh, yeah, so just the last point, um, we shouldn't make assumptions on the distribution of noise. So after having done that, uh, I started uh, spending a little bit of time on are there some easy, low-hanging improvements that I can do uh, to make interpreting these results, uh, to, to make interpreting numbers coming out of uh, running benchmarks easier. So a first very simple uh, improvement that was made is before when you looked at charts, it only showed uh, an aggregate of the multiple sample points uh, for a particular revision uh, of Clang. Uh, and uh, now we enabled uh, just showing all the sample points. So by default right now, uh, the aggregation function is uh, minimum or maximum, depending on whether the metric, it, it shows you uh, by default the best possible uh, execution. Um, so if you start looking into this, uh, for this program, you see it wasn't extremely noisy for a while, and then all of a sudden, something changed in the code generation, and you see it's bimodal behavior. If you would not have shown the multiple sample points at that point, you would have assumed, oh, this program has gotten quite a bit better, but actually it turned into bimodal behavior, and the aggregation function being the minimum doesn't show you that. So just another example of a program that seems to be well, I would really need a distribution histogram to be sure, but it looks like it's somewhat bimodal here. Um, I think this is an example that, that indicates that 
probably, well, I think the minimum or maximum is not the right aggregation function for this. Probably average is already much, much better. Uh, but yeah, we have all kinds of distributions, so um, it's sometimes it's hard to to really characterize the full performance, the, the characterize the performance of your program executing in just a single number. We try to do that because it makes life easier for us. We can just say this program, yeah, seven is the speed of it, instead of this is distribution. Uh, so a second thing that was added, uh, so LMT has a daily report page. Um, so this is what it looked like uh, when uh, uh, when I started looking at this. So this was just uh, this is just a screenshot from a report from a particular page. Uh, this is on uh, some of our internal bots. It's also Juno bots running on A53, A57, and A9 in there, A, uh, both in 64-bit and 32-bit mode. So just uh, an example. And then um, we also uh, we make sure that at least someone looks at these results on a daily basis to, to try to get a grip on how is performance evolving over time. Uh, so and before we look at these numbers, and then you s that, then you see like oh yeah, there's some greens, there's some reds. Uh, but if then you start looking at the charts, you saw so which ones are noisy? Is, is some of this in the noise, or did it actually change that much? So um, what was added is just on that page have uh, something like a spark line, but with all the sample points uh, attached to it. And then, without having to click through the web interface uh, a lot, you can just immediately see uh, on that uh, top program, yeah, the performance changes look real. It's low noise. Um, the, the second program in here, yeah, that looks like noise. It's, this must be a program with bimodal behavior. You run three samples. If on a particular day you happen to be lucky or unlucky, your three samples show the same, uh, all should uh, end up in the same bimodal bucket. You get one result, if on another day they also uh, end up in the, the other bimodal bucket, you get another result. And if you just look at a single number, day by day, you just think, oh, my, my performance jumped up again. Oh no, it regressed again. Um, so yeah, it's just noise. And then the lower part, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, just looking at that chart, I, ca I can't make my mind up, is this good, is this bad? Uh, probably, I, let's call it just noise. Um, so, uh, one other thing while running this, uh, the test suite uh, that stood out is that well, some of these programs run really, really, really shortly. Um, maybe they're, and, and, and they tend to be high noise, maybe they just don't do enough work. So, I just analyzed the programs that run for uh, less than 10 milliseconds. It turned out a whole bunch of them just didn't have any loop in it. You enter main, just uh, go through all instructions. It never executes an instructions twice. Pretty clear that should not be considered a, a, a benchmark. Um, probably they're good tests, but they're not benchmarks. Uh, there were about 10 other programs that just do very little work, like I think one of the programs just uh, parse 10 or 20 C declarations. Just too little work to do. Um, so these were also re removed from the benchmarking modes. They're still in the test suite if you run it in the test mode to check for correctness, but from benchmarking mode, they're removed. And there were three programs that executed extremely fast, and it turns out that just the whole main function co completely optimized the way, which is a great thing, right? If, you're, if, if, the, if the program doesn't do anything, your compiler should remove it. So and these are good benchmarks to keep. Mm, so while starting to look into the, the program runtime, um, yes, yeah, some of these programs r run for a particularly long time and some run very quickly. Um, so yeah, the, so th these are two charts just trying to represent the same data. It's just how long uh, each uh, program runs. So on the left-hand side, you just see a stack bar with the l longest running program on the, on the bottom. So there's one program ticking. One out of these 300 programs take about 8% of the total execution time of the test suite. Um, it showed that in the Polybench subsuite, uh, a lot of these programs took quite a lot of time. Just looking into it, it uh, all of the time was spent in printf. Okay, so the um, it was basically the, the the program prints out a whole matrix, a really like 4,000 by 4,000 matrix, and all of the time is, was spent just converting 
the binary representation into a textual representation. So by uh, so Renato fixed that a couple of well, a couple of months ago now. So just the overall test suite started executing 5% faster, and because you don't have uh, all of your time spent in this printf and, and producing lots and lots and lots of uh, I/O, the I/O also reduced a bit. It became slightly less noisy. I think this may be one of the uh, the last imp well improvements I made. I happen to be executed on a big little board, so it's, it has uh, A53 cores and it has A57 cores. Um, when I built the programs, I want them to build as quickly as possible, so I just use all six cores available. Sometimes your build job ends up on A53, sometimes your build job ends up on A57. So the compile time numbers, they were extremely noisy, and you wouldn't expect them to be, to be stable because sometimes you're running on one core, sometimes on another core. So we just added the flag to LNT to be able to mark if you set up a, a, a benchmarking bot and you know that some of your um, metrics are going to be garbage, just don't submit it to the server. All right. Um, so yeah, the, I think for the, the first time, I actually tried to make some changes to LNT. It must have been like half a year ago and then I found, wow, oh, it's, it's not that easy to make changes. Uh, well, making changes is not that hard, but being sure that you didn't break anything, that's, uh, that, was, that was pretty uh, tough. So, um, LNT does have regression tests. Um, um, and, uh, well, the, the, it does test database uh, functionality. It used to be just a binary dump of SQLite that has been changed. So now we have SQL statements. All the regression tests are text. Um, also, uh, an initial developer's guide was made on how to run the regression test. So I think by now, um, LNT really is close to uh, what the other sub-projects are like for developing. You have regression tests. You should add functionality, uh, a test for every piece of functionality you add. If you fix a bug, you should add the test. I think it has become quite a bit easier that way to develop uh, LNT. Um, I may have to speed up a little bit, so uh, I'm just going to uh, jump over the summary apart from, I actually ended up setting this board in a, as a public bot, um, and I chose to run the benchmarks on the Cortex-A53. They run slower, but they're less noise. Just a trade-off I made at that point. There were a few other improvements uh, in LNT that have been made uh, in the past year, not directly derived from these um, investigations. Uh, something that was added very recently is just, uh, what if we just record the a hash fingerprint of uh, the program binaries? The idea is that from day to day, maybe most programs, the code generate for programs don't change that much. If you would have a number of days where we could just quickly check the binary is actually the same. We could collect all the samples from the runs on these days and have a larger statistical profile to start analyzing. Um, so, and this is uh, the, the chart shows for five, six consecutive days just what percentage of the programs in the test suite changed based on, the ha on these uh, hash uh, fingerprints on a number of different um, AR64 targets. Oh no, it's AR64 and AR32. So, yeah. Um, it looks believable, like uh, on a Sunday, the day before, on Saturday, not much changed. On a Monday, the day before, on Sunday, not many people do check-ins. And then on the, for, uh, on the Monday, things changed again. But still, less than 6% of all programs changed. So hopefully, uh, we can make good use of that information. It's not being used right now, but hopefully, we can make good use of that information. Then uh, uh, a few other major improvements, uh, Chris Matthews has been adding quite a few different things that I just want to very briefly uh, uh, mention here. So the, the analysis algorithm to the automatically detect is this a regression or is this just noise? Uh, some significant improvements were made. Some further improvements are probably still possible. Um, just two weeks ago, a, a performance tracking user interface and database has been added, currently just prototype stage. But the idea is that if you have, for example, uh, you see, uh, 10 different programs change performance. Maybe it's all down to the same root cause. The idea is that uh, you could tag that and maybe link them to a bug report or something like that. Uh, and another great tool that was added very recently is a, 
uh, LVM bisect all the ideas. These bots build uh, Clang binaries continuously. Why don't you store the Clang binaries in a cache? And if you're uh, bisecting on your interactively, then you don't have to rebuild Clang all the time. You just fetch them from the cache. Should speed up your your, your work. Uh, also, a number of new metrics were added. A score for where benchmark where higher means better. Uh, Membytes. Um, there was also a bunch of stability fixes to uh, to, to on the server side. Uh, both just general bug fixes, uh, and there's ideas about using uh, REST interfaces so that, um, and doing offline computation. One of the things we see right now is that sometimes it takes a long time to load a page because the server has to do a lot of data number crunching before you can show a full chart. So if you can do that, that computation before someone asks the page to show, or maybe just on the first time and someone else asks the same page, you don't have to redo the computation. And a bunch of user interface uh, improvements. And then um, I'd just like to, in this last part of the, the talk, like to uh, um, just present a few ideas or thoughts uh, I, I have. So on the public bots right now, we only run the test suites uh, as a benchmark. Um, that's probably because uh, a lot of uh, other benchmarks uh, are commercial, have terms and conditions that don't allow you to publicly post numbers. Um, <clears throat> so um, these commercial benchmarks sometimes run for a long time. Maybe in a test suite, we just want something that's representative of, of real world. But can we then maybe also make the test suite run, just run very fast? Uh, and I think that's related to uh, what uh, Chandler's presentation from a few weeks ago on CppCon 2015. He presented like having something like uh, micro benchmarks. Should the test suite evolve into a micro benchmark suite? I'm not sure, but I think it's just an idea, maybe something to, that could be discussed at the buff this afternoon. Um, just going to do this really quickly. If we made all of the programs run at mo in the test suite at most for 100, milliseconds, the test suite would run 200 times faster. If we would say, well, maybe every program has to run uh, for up to a second to get low noise, we would still have a 24x speed up. So on low boards, uh, on slower boards, that would get as much higher resolution in, in getting uh, performance samples. Just an idea, not sure if it can be done. Um, Let's see. Um, so yeah, I'm, the one thing where the test suite helps is that uh, it can be run on public boards, which means that you can also, if you commit something, you can say the, cha uh, the effect of your patch on another platform you don't have access to. It's really only, we can only do that with a test suite because the commercial benchmarks have these terms and conditions that you can't really see the data. But then the question arises, is the test suite really representative enough of real world? the real world, um, it would be great to, be, to somehow, in a scientific way, be able to measure this test suite for compiler optimization work. How, how representative is it compared to other uh, suites of software? I don't know of anyone having ever tried to solve that problem. If anyone in the audience has an ID, uh, please speak to me. Um, just going to move on. Um, I'm, so about making data actionable, right now I think it's still a lot of work once the system tells you there was a regression to get to the point where you understand what really happened. So right now, for, this is just uh, one example I took some screenshots from. On the daily page, you will see 22% regression. You see, oh, okay, it's real. You look at the overall graph, yeah, it's real. Um, then typically the, the two questions you ask is, so which commit did this? Um, you can start bisecting. In the example, this happened to be a commit uh, that uh, made a fix to if conversion specifically for ARM. Okay? And then the next question I ask myself is, so what's the hot code that changed so that the performance changed so that I can get a better insight? Um, and right now, um, that's kind of manual work, it, quite laborious. Uh, and I would want the system to just tell me, here it is. So, couldn't we, for example, use Linux Perf to just store the traces? Um, 
So just, this is just on the left-hand side before, faster, right-hand side, uh, after, uh, and slower. Uh, then you see, this is what uh, Linux Perf shows you. The numbers in the left-hand column are percentages, how much percent of the total execution time was spent on that instruction. Okay. So what I do after that typically is I want to figure out what the control flow structure is of this code. Wouldn't it be nice that if a tool just told me that I don't have to start drawing uh, lines? Okay, cool. Uh, you see indeed that a branch has been eliminated. There was an if conversion. Okay, cool. It's, uh, the commit says that was something about if conversion. I'm probably on the right track. Uh, okay, and now trying to figure out, just look at these percentages. So where exactly did performance change? That one's very clear. And I, there, there's two, I think there's two reasons for that. So one reason is these are relative percentages. So um, the before program ran for a certain amount of time. The after program ran for maybe 20% longer. So the percentages aren't equal. You're not looking at like for like comparison. So I think really this should be absolute numbers. And also, um, well, perv or uh, statistical uh, profiling, typically you get a little bit of noise, you get a bit of noise in where time is not uh, necessarily um, assigned to, the to a single specific instruction, but you get a little bit of spread around the instructions that actually spend most of the time. So at least in this example, I think it would be more meaningful to, for example, per basic block or per loop, get a summary automatically of not a relative number, but an absolute number of so much time was spent here. And then at least if you do it like that, in this particular case, you would indeed see, all right, so this loop before, uh, this loop uh, now takes 150% of the time. And if we would be able to get that, uh, I think we would save so many man hours uh, between all of us. So just uh, summarizing up, um, some really good uh, progress has been made this year on making continuous integration uh, better for performance tracking, um, signaling issues quickly and reliably. I think with the uh, improvements made, uh, with the, all the changes made, that has improved quite a bit. I would say it's amber status right now. It works, can still be improved. Um, there's low false positive and low, low false negative rates, at least in practice. We, we don't see that as being a huge problem, probably can still be improved a bit. In a way that's actionable, um, I think the, uh, the Spark lines have helped a lot, but really like on the last few, past few slides, there's still a lot of human work involved. Um, I think we're really not there yet uh, for presenting information in an actionable way. Um, and so um, are we in a situation where we have this culture of acting on changes? I don't think so. We first need to solve the, like make it really easy to, to look into performance deltas. Uh, and then I think we will get there. I just want to say in the past year, it's become easier to work on LLT. If you've got IDs, don't be afraid to work on patches. There's regression tests now. Um, and just my last point, this afternoon at 2 p.m., we've got a buff. So if you're passionate about this or you think things can be done better, please come and discuss your IDs. Thank you very much. So we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, we have a mic stand over here. If you have a question, I'm going to stand on this side of the room and pass out the mic. Uh, you mentioned there was some noise due to uh, the outer space layout randomization. Would it make sense to deliberately change around the layout of all the programs? I know there has been some work outside of the LLVM community to do that sort of thing. Would that be a good thing to have for the test suite, or do you think the randomization we get from just the operating system randomizing the layout is sufficient? Yeah, so that's where I said that uh, the address, address space randomization probably isn't really perfect, which is a step towards getting you the full profile of how this program behaves over different layouts. Yeah, um, probably you would need a compiler to start randomizing code layout and then uh, running all of, with, with uh, a randomized code layout running that. Then on the other hand, there are uh, hot and cold code placement techniques in compilers. This is something that you would expect a compiler to be able to do. 
you wouldn't want to randomize that, but other parts, uh, if you randomize that, probably you get an even better overall picture of how could my program behave uh, if I make an, an optimization in an unrelated part of the code, something like that. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your talk. Um, one of the problems I have understanding uh, performance on ARM is understanding what the pipeline model is. So, for example, going between A9 and A15, there, there are quite big differences. Um, can you imagine a world where we'd actually have uh, pipeline models and could see the stalls associated with instructions? Yes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, that depends on whether the microarchitects of chips decide to open up that information or not, right? So, not much I can say about that. Any other questions? So, uh, thanks for the talk first. Um, so, I'm working on Poly currently, which is out of tree. We have our own build bots, which only test x86, but uh, let's say it's in tree or I work on something else and I get results from an ARM from an ARM machine or something, I can't reproduce them. What am I going to do now? So even if I get those, like, the little pictures and they tell me, oh yeah, this happened. It's like, nothing, not really useful for me. I, I, I'm not able to fix that. I'm not able to change that except reverting my patch. It's like the only way I can do it. Yeah, so I, I think right now, there's absolute, that's really absolutely nothing you can do. The only thing that feedback that you get is we had such a percentage change here. If you, I think that if you would be able to get like, uh, a diff between assembly, the generated assembly, um, and if it's for, well, if it's for an instruction set that uh, is not too different from the instruction set you're used to, you at least can get an impression of what was happening here. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still a problem, but it, at least it would get, get you some, uh, I think it would be helpful, but yeah, sometimes you would then need to reach out to people with actual access to, to the platform. Thanks. Any more questions? So one of the issues I have seen is with the cache hierarchy. So you showed A53, A57, and somebody puts in an optimization that you know, helps A53 or A57. Both. So there's two issues. One is somebody puts a back-to-back -back load optimization, and one of the microarchitectures will have a different pipeline, and that can take advantage of that. The other one is the cache hierarchy. Some of these uh, noises could be because A53 has a completely different cache subsystem compared to the A57. So is that captured in the uh, results conveyed back to the developer saying, okay, this is the platform, this is the cache subsystem, and I'm most worried about somebody putting in an optimization and then just declaring that, oh, it's good, when there is so many variations and shades yep. of gray. Um. So I'm not entirely sure what the question is, so but I can tell. I, I are, are you communicating the setup so that the developer right. can look at it? Well, um, no, but it, it could be done. Okay. I mean, right now it's not like we have a, a one single location that everyone can look at. That's where all the different public bots are described. But yeah, we could do that. Um, on the mm -hmm. uh, on the cache effects, maybe another idea would be like if we find uh, a regression, maybe do some kind of rerun of the same program on the board and also use performance counters to just measure the typical suspects like cache, be cache behavior, branch prediction behavior, did that change? Um, that could also help. Um, I'd say let's first get to just cycle counts, show that, and then move on from there. But, but, but yeah. no, the cache effect I'm not talking about is not across A53 runs. I'm talking about on A53 you get a particular set, and then A57 you get a completely different set. So that that is definitely one concern, right? Uh, the the other question I had was, uh, so you, you if you pub if you publish the setup, uh, is there someone going to, going back and saying, look, this particular optimization probably is applicable to say A53 only. So can we restrict the optimization to that particular target, sub-target? So that's where I'm most interested in is because 
if somebody puts in a code, uses the infrastructure, and says, yeah, it's okay, it looks okay, kind of, and then it's, it's up to others to go and later track down and figure out, oh, this optimization is probably not applicable for this particular sub-target. Right. So would you then, are you really asking for that should be public bots where you can test out the patch before you commit it onto um, trunk? At least, at least information after the fact that, right. that okay. conveys what is the impact of this particular optimization on a system with a particular setup. Right, right. But, but then it becomes a question of just making sure there's enough bots running for all the different targets that are important and having them run with high enough resolution, ideally for every commit you want a full benchmark run, but that's not always possible. Um, I don't have a clear, this is the that's, right that's way to do it answer, but yeah, I, uh, well, that's something we need to evolve into, right? But it's going to take some time. So one quick question, uh, do you run these in performance mode or do you run these in just interactive mode, no, the course? Uh, and I haven't changed anything from, I haven't changed anything from a default Debian setup apart from turning off uh, all operating system services that aren't needed and most of them you don't need. Because one of the things we have found is that uh, putting it in performance mode and controlling, making sure that the, the core frequency doesn't change is, is really required to have, get a meaningful measure of the performance. <clears throat> right, so at least on this board, I didn't see that, uh, that didn't see that problem, but yeah, I mean, I can easily uh, see that uh, in certain setups, you definitely have to do that. Was it running Android or Linux? Linux. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, last question. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm quite new in LLVM, uh, so sorry for this question. <clears throat> uh, but it's probably a typical situation when you change some heuristics in optimization, and you get, you might, you might get some regressions. But in, 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 in average, the effect is positive. How such situations are handled, especially when some bots collect some data, does it collect some improvements as well? So, <clears throat> I don't know a way of how to fully automatically handle that. I think this is a that's a situation where that, um, regression tracking user interface that Chris is working on could help, or you could say all of these programs, all of a sudden you see spikes in both directions. You do, hopefully with a little bit of manual analysis, you see, oh yeah, I, I recognize this, the heuristic changed, it's good in this case, it's bad in this case. But then for all of these programs in that user interface, you can all combine them and say, this was all caused by this particular one thing. And at least that way it's tracked um, then making a decision on should this heuristic be changed, yes or no, that still remains the uh, same situation as today. It's, uh, there aren't always black and white answers on obviously this is always good or obviously this is always bad. It's a, it's a judgment call. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's thank Krista. Okay.